This is inside the right. So Tim, Tim Wallace was just announced as VP. We've now got J.D. Vance out there accusing him of stolen valor for serving in the National Guard and not deploying overseas. You were a Republican your whole life. Do you think that this tack right here is a smart strategy for Vance? You know, you have to admit that it worked in 2004 kind of on John Kerry. And and the, the, this is the guy, Chris Lasavita, that is the chief strategist for Trump Vance, ran the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth campaign, which was a disgusting smear on John Kerry's military service in 2004. Now, did that work? I, you know, I don't know. I, Bush won anyway. There are a lot of reasons why Bush won. It was a pretty close election, frankly. Um, so, you know, there's, there is an audience for this, I guess is what I'll say. I, I don't think it's the, the message that I would lead with. And I think in this case, there is some particular differences <laughs> where with the John Kerry case. And some of this is just marketing and branding. I and mean, John Kerry, even though he was a real war hero, like came off as kind of a feat. And, you know, he's a rich kid and like spoke French and stuff like that. And so I get played into the caricature of him a little bit. But now now it's flipped because Vance is the Silicon Valley right. um, venture capitalist. And Tim Wallace is as like down to earth, normal guy as you could get. Exactly. So that's where I was going with this. So I, that's why I think that it probably does not work in this case. Um, and because Tim Walsh just doesn't give off, stole, you know, stolen valor. Also, he's in the military for two decades. And it's like J.D. Vance, you know, uh, we appreciate his service and all this. But if you're going to engage in these kind of attacks, it's not like J.D. Vance was you know, a Navy SEAL. Okay. Right. He was like in the public affairs department. Like he did, he did we'll go over there and serve. We appreciate the service, but like, then he comes home, he goes to Yale. He does a Holly, he goes to Hollywood. He goes to Silicon Valley. I, it's just, it's not giving, you know, salt to the earth. Okay. Right. And so I, I don't think that that hit is going to work for JD Vance. And, um, and, and I think that some of the, you know, other attacks may be more potent. It, it does seem like Vance and Trump are both in the throes of some type of what, what feels like a desperation right now. Trump is trying to attack Kamala Harris on her blackness. Vance is trying to attack Waltz on his military service that, that was six times longer than Vance's own service. So clearly there's a sense of Republicans campaign right now kind of falling apart. But it's actually a, a, a vicious cycle here because the more that they fall apart, the more desperate they get. And then the more desperate they get, the, the crazier the things they say are. So do you foresee this getting better or is it just going to continue? Are, are the wheels just going to continue falling off the wagon as it speeds downhill right now? Yeah, they're going to need something to happen uh, from outside the campaign to change this trajectory, I think, because I, I, the, the Donald Trump, just, just think about the conversations we were having a month ago, two months ago. For Trump, he was being relatively calm, right? He's still Trump. He's still bleeding out insane stuff on his social media feed. But for Trump, you know, he was dialing it back. He thought he was winning. So he was playing, you know, playing a little safer. Now he's out there. It's like, you know, he has the new racist. I don't really know why it's racist, but just is Kamabla. Like, I don't even know what that yeah. is. Like, he's just really grasping. JD is is really reaching in a lot of his attacks. I, like the, the whole idea that Kamala Harris isn't black when she's biracial, when JD's kids are biracial, I, you know, like it just doesn't, it's like ridiculous. And if you listen to the reporters, I, I've been out of the, out of the uh, MAGA world for long enough that they don't really tell me what their strategy is. But if you listen to reporters that still talk to the Trump campaign, like the strategists want Trump and JD to talk about how Harrison Walls are big liberals. Like that's what they think would work. And, uh, and it's just like Trump isn't capable of doing it. JD wants to keep daddy happy. I think, you know, so how do they reverse that? I, it's it's kind of hard to see. I think they're going to need something else to happen to shake up the race. There have been a lot of things that have shaken up the race this year, so it could happen. Yeah. Tim, we've got Scott Baio out on Fox News begging Donald Trump to stick to policy. <laughs> like, if that's, yeah. if that's not a testament. When you've got Weird Scott stuff. Baio, who sounds like the completely rational one out there, yeah. I mean, you, you, you might have lost the plot. Yeah, they also start cable. And my favorite clip from the J.D. Vance press conference, uh, you know, the same one where he attacks Tim Wall's military service was when a reporter asks him what makes him happy. And he's like, uh, mean questions from the fake news make me happy. And then he goes on to say, but actually I am angry. Like he doesn't he doesn't say like yeah. my kids, you know, or ice cream or the Cincinnati right. Reds. or I don't know. Like it's something a normal a person that makes a normal person happy. I, so I think that like his fundamental weirdness and Trump's, you know, uh, fundamental kind of derangement uh, make it hard to like imagine a scenario where these guys get back on message.
Well, it doesn't seem like he he actually can allow himself to be happy because that's not that's not what they're selling. That's not the product that they're selling. They're selling demagoguery. They're selling fear of immigrants, of brown people, of of women, of trans people, of liberals aborting babies after they were born. I mean, the the whole message is is fear. And so if you present yourself as positive, first of all, that that's that's antithetical to the campaign. But second of all, they're just not good at it. Like J.D. Vance is not comfortable in his own skin. It looks like it's his first day in, in, in his own skin. And so and so if if the if the battle here is going to be a battle between happy happy warriors, then Wallace and Trump are going to just inherently authentically lose to Kamala Harris and Tim Wallace every single time. Uh, yeah, I, no, I, I just, the grievance, I mean, you got into a lot of the fear, but that even underneath the fear, it's the grievance, right? It's like that things, you know, we've been put upon. And you heard that in J.D. Vance's speech at the convention, right, which was which was on teleprompter, like talking about how, you know, their case is to these working class voters in the upper Midwest, that like they have all these things to be aggrieved about and that the elite society, you know, has to, has been bad leadership and has let them down and is thrusting drag queen, queen story hour in their face. And, you know, they should be mad about it. And so, you know, when you like have to convince yourself every day to be mad about this fake stuff, um, you know, it's hard to like turn your brain back to how to be a happy warrior. And uh, it's, I just, so I don't think it's going to happen for them. Talk about the addition of Tim Walsh to the ticket. You know, you've got some pros and cons that we've spoken about off camera. What, what does he add to the ticket as far as reaching Republicans are concerned? And where does he have more work uh, to do here? Yeah, I mean, I think that what he adds to the ticket is a good balance for Kamala Harris as far as just identity and kind of image is concerned. Um, you know, he being a veteran, being a teacher, uh, it's just like he doesn't own any stocks. He doesn't even own a house. Uh, he's a very he's a working class guy from the Midwest. She's from the coast. She's a lawyer. Um, you know, uh, he went to a state school, right? I, so I think that's nice for the ticket. Um, you know, it, it makes it harder for the Republicans to, you know, sort of argue that this these are just coastal elites right. that care about that only care about. You know the interests of the cultural lead on in New York and DC and LA and San Francisco. Like it's hard to do that when you have Tim Walls on the ticket, who literally went to San Francisco for the first time <laughs> last month, apparently. Yeah. Uh, which is a fun fact about him. I've loved to learn. So I think that is what one thing that they bring. Another thing that he brings, uh, you can see, is just uh, he's done nothing to slow the vibes and the energy around the Harris campaign. I think the, the the base voters, and when I say base voters, I don't even mean like the super activists. I mean, people who are Democrats that just weren't that excited about this election earlier, like they're excited and engaged now. And you just see this in the numbers of uh, in polling, but you also see it in the events. They've, they're in this huge record crowd today in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. So I think th that is the stuff that he brings, which is good, a nice balance to the ticket and kind of keeping the momentum going. Um, with her. Uh, the, the thing that I worry about is I don't know that he brings anything as far as like reaching the suburban Romney Biden voters that we've been talking about a lot in this, you know, in this program. Uh, and um, yeah, and I think that that just means that the Harris Wall ticket is going to have to work a little harder in reaching those voters than maybe they would have had she picked Josh Shapiro or Pete or somebody that had a more natural affinity for that crowd. I think sometimes the Democrats are like, that guy's in a, in a, you know, camo hat. So Republicans must love him. And it's kind of like, well, uh, you know, Republicans know liberals that are in camo hats. <laughs> like it's not like it's not like this is a shocking thing to them. Like they they have people in their lives that are that are liberal, that are the school social studies teacher in a rural community being a liberal is like not a breaking news thing for Republicans. So I, I think that his record in Minnesota is super progressive and accomplished. And so if you're looking at, you know, I always go back to my North Star. I think about my friends in Atlanta. Atlanta suburbs, voted for W. Bush, voted for Romney, don't like Trump, came around on Biden. That's a key swing done, you know, um, and uh, and and I think that the Harris Walls team is going to have to, you know, do a little bit more outreach to that group than maybe they would have had to do had it been Harris Shapiro or Harris uh, Buttigieg. So what part of Tim Walls's background, what 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 part of his agenda, what should he what should he lean in on to reach exactly those people? Like, what is the the, the part of his 
of his whole persona that you think is going to be most helpful to him as we head forward in this campaign? Yeah, I liked um, in his introductory video, I noticed he said the word compromise three times. I liked that. He was in the House. I think Democrats want to focus a lot on his governor agenda because it was very progressive. Um, and that gets Democrats excited. He like, you know, the free school lunches and the legal weed and, you know, climate stuff. Like he checked a lot of the progressive boxes. But when he's in the House, he was more of a bipartisan kind of center left Democrat. Um, and Nancy Pelosi's pushed this when she's been talking about him. He was on the Veterans Committee. Um, you know, he worked a lot on ag issues. So I, I think just kind of talking about that experience how he knows how to work with the other side, um, how, you know, he in, in, in Minnesota, some of the other things he did is some tax cuts and some reforms of the regulatory uh, regime there in the state to make it kind of easier for government to get things done, cutting some red tape. So, I, you know, I think that talking a little bit more about that issue set, talking about compromise, along with talking about his bio of just, I'm a good, uh, you can trust me. You know, I'm, I was a teacher, I was a soldier. I've worked with conservatives. I've lived near conservatives. I've coached conservatives. I know how to work with them. I respect them. I don't. I don't. I'm not looking down on them and saying they're deplorables, um, you know. And so I think that that, you know, if he kind of focuses on that part of the message, uh, I think that will help. And I think, frankly, this is going to be a big job for Kamala Harris. And I think the, the top of the ticket is more important than the VP. And as long as she's leaning in on her, her record as a prosecutor, caring about law and order, you know. Um, and, and her also experience uh, uh, in Washington doing bipartisan stuff and, and supporting Ukraine uh, when a lot of the Republicans haven't, uh, strong national security, believing in America's role in the world. I think those are some ways for them to uh, appeal to that demo. Well, definitely looking forward to what you all do at the Bulwark in terms of continuing to figure out the best way to reach those, you know, Republicans, former Republicans, independents, conservative Democrats out there um, and, and figuring out the messages that are going to best resonate with them. So um, that is the exact kind of content we need to be lifting up. So for those watching this episode right now, please make sure to subscribe to The Bulwark so that more people will be able to see that content and help it reach more Republicans, independents and conservative Democrats out there. So I'll put the link to The Bulwark right here on the screen and also in the post description of this video. I'm Brian Taylor Cohen. I'm Tim Miller. This is Inside the Right. 